Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named American Horror Stories, Season 3, Hulu Ween Event. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled Bestie, begins with everyone on the performance stage bustling about when a mysterious figure poured something into a pot. As the crucible took center stage, the actors who drank the water from the pot suddenly collapsed, vomiting uncontrollably. The scene shifts to three months prior, when a young girl, Shelby, was seated at her new home's doorstep, engrossed in videos of her favorite actress. Noticing his daughter's mood, her father presented a toy to interrupt her reverie. When Shelby learned he intended to discard the toy, she hugged the doll and retreated to her room as if it was her most treasured possession. On the stairs, she spotted a box bearing her mother's name. Lost in thought, her father placed the box on a table, the clattering noise catching Shelby's attention. He told her that the cup was a gift for her mother's Teacher of the Year award. He comforted Shelby, expressing his hope that she would quickly settle into the new environment. Although her mother had passed away from cancer, in this new city, she no longer needed to worry about others' opinions and could become whoever she wished. At her new school, Shelby's attire drew the attention of her peers. During choir practice, they openly ridiculed her clothes and style, causing her to perform poorly. In a fit of anger, she hurled a book at the mocking classmates. As a result, Shelby was punished by her teacher and sent out of the classroom. After class, the teacher sought Shelby out for a conversation. Shelby admitted her mistake to the teacher, who surprisingly expressed understanding and even brought up her mother, revealing that they were close friends. Her mother's outstanding reputation had left a lasting impression, and the teacher expressed sorrow for her passing, assuring Shelby that she would grow up to be brave. Upon leaving the office, the classmates who had laughed at her earlier approached, seemingly apologetic, but then provoked Shelby with even harsher words. Back home, Shelby and her father were having dinner, with Shelby evidently more interested in watching videos than engaging in conversation with him. Her father produced a photo found amongst her mother's belongings, hoping to inspire Shelby. The sight of the photo made Shelby stand up nervously, accidentally knocking over a candlestick. After cleaning up, her father returned to the table and inquired whether any students had said something to upset her. Shelby quickly retorted and, clutching her phone, stormed back to her room. In her room, she continued to watch her favorite actor known for his cross-dressing performances. Shelby admired the actor's bold attire and outspokenness. After the live stream ended, Shelby noticed a stranger in the chat with the username Best Friend Forever, who had been greeting her. Hesitantly, she replied, and as she learned of their shared admiration for the same actor, her guard began to lower down. When the stranger suggested a video chat, Shelby agreed without hesitation. Once the video connected, the screen revealed a woman with a distorted face. Although the woman looked strange, Shelby wasn't bothered and even shared her recent argument with her father. As they bonded over criticizing their fathers, a smile formed on Shelby's face. When Shelby asked for her name, the woman confessed her real name sounded unpleasant and suggested they give each other nicknames and henceforth address each other by those names. The woman then told Shelby she could call her Bestie, a secret between just the two of them. Shelby happily agreed. Shelby, having made a good friend, was no longer lonely. The first thing she did after school each day was to video chat with Bestie. While trying on makeup in the style of their favorite actor, Bestie showered Shelby with compliments, telling her how beautiful she was and suggesting that she should definitely wear makeup to school. Although hesitant at first, Shelby was persuaded by Bestie's encouragement and decided to do her eye makeup, arriving at school with newfound confidence. Her makeup drew laughter from other students, but the confident Shelby didn't take it to heart. After all, where there was mockery, there was also appreciation. In class, a playboy kept stealing glances at her, intending to trigger her hormones. After the lesson, the teacher announced an audition for the fall play was coming up and secretly told Shelby that she was very suited for the lead role, hoping she would audition on time. Exiting the classroom, the same students who had mocked her were there, making snide remarks, but this time Shelby retorted with grace. Back home, she recounted the day's events to Bestie with excitement, sharing how she had stood up to those who had ridiculed her. Bestie continued to praise the transformative power of makeup, telling Shelby she had done something very brave. Then, Bestie shared that she had done something big herself that day. She had hidden her father's wallet to play a prank on him. Impressed by Bestie's boldness, Shelby thought she was amazing. Bestie then suggested Shelby could do the same and hide something of her father's. 
Faced with Shelby's hesitation, Bestie questioned if she was scared. Under Bestie's influence, Shelby ended up hiding her mother's Teacher of the Year trophy. Watching her dad anxiously look for it, she feigned calmness, pretending she hadn't seen it. Next, Bestie had another daring proposal, to smash the trophy to face their fears together. Compelled by their pact, Shelby went to the table and shattered the trophy. At that moment, she felt a sense of relief wash down her spine to her butt. Bestie thanked her in the video chat for trusting her so much. Then Shelby asked the question that had been weighing on her mind. Why had Bestie become like this? Visibly upset, Bestie took off her headwear to reveal a scalp covered with red spots. She told Shelby that she was an adopted child, that her mother had used drugs during pregnancy, which affected her development and led to her current appearance. She had no friends and had never been outside. Hearing this, Shelby tearfully apologized to Bestie. Perhaps moved by her story, Shelby offered to be Bestie's avatar to fulfill any wish for her. In exchange for sharing her innermost secret, Bestie asked Shelby to fulfill a wish for her. So Shelby began throwing eggs at other people's houses, shoplifting from supermarkets without paying, and running off with the food. The wild behavior brought her joy, but also fueled the conflict with her father. The rebellious Shelby, following Bestie's advice, missed the play audition, but by now she didn't care about the consequences. During the performance, she added a drug to a pot, causing her classmates to be poisoned and vomit. After fleeing the performance hall, Shelby told Bestie she had never been so happy and thanked her for helping her face her fears. They made a pact that best friends should always be together for life. Halloween was approaching, and Shelby met Bestie's request by dressing up as a nurse clown for school. Her odd behavior shocked the teachers and students alike. Upon learning of this, her father dragged her home, angrily demanding to know what had transpired. He could hardly recognize his daughter after such a change. Disregarding her protests, he locked her in a dark room. In the storeroom, Shelby found her mother's old belongings, from which she retrieved a computer to call Bestie. Bestie insisted Shelby must leave the room and came up with a plan. If Shelby broke her own bone, her father would surely let her out. Shelby thought the idea was crazy, but Bestie questioned whether she had forgotten their promise, taunting her as a coward and unworthy of their friendship. Distressed to see Bestie upset, Shelby quickly apologized and committed to the plan. Her voice woke her father, who was on guard outside, and asked with concern who she was talking to. In the room, following Bestie's urging, Shelby placed her hand on a shelf and forcefully hammered it down, resulting in a chicken scream. Her father burst into the room to find Shelby with a self-inflicted broken wrist and hurriedly took her to the hospital. After the incident, Shelby began to engage positively with treatment, even repairing a broken cup she had previously smashed and giving it to her father, which helped mend their strained relationship. As the new term began, Shelby wanted to apologize to her teacher with flowers in hand, but discovered there was a new teacher for the subject. After leaving the classroom, she received a text message from Bestie, who kept asking if Shelby was around. Choosing a different path in haste, Shelby encountered the playboy who had previously laughed at her. He asked to sign her cast, and after doing so, he bid her farewell, leaving her puzzled. Another text message followed, directing her to the auditorium at 3 p.m. With trepidation, Shelby went and found the playboy waiting for her. He confessed to having witnessed what she did during the performance. Shelby begged him not to tell anyone else, but the playboy commended her bravery for doing what many would not dare. He had been observing her all year and genuinely wanted to be her friend. They had a pleasant conversation and decided to go eat somewhere else. As they left, Shelby received another message from Bestie, but this time she chose not to respond, determined to cut her ties with Bestie. Accompanied by the playboy, Shelby's life was once again filled with laughter. She integrated with her classmates and sincerely apologized to her teacher alongside them. The drama performance was a success, and her relationship with the playboy began to heat up. While getting made up for another play, she received a video call from Bestie, but this time she didn't hesitate to hit the delete button. The success of the play presented Shelby with the opportunity to choose a university, and after much thought, she decided to attend the same university as the playboy. Faced with her decision, both her teacher and father chose to be understanding. Leaving the office, Shelby couldn't wait to get to the library to share the good news with the playboy. At that moment, her computer received another message from Bestie. The playboy took the computer and asked who this person was. Shelby explained it was just a woman who kept bothering her. The playboy had a strange look on his face upon hearing this, but Shelby didn't notice. Realizing this woman was constantly hassling Shelby, the playboy proceeded to delete all of the woman's information from the computer. He then suggested taking Shelby to a beautiful place to relax. They drove to an abandoned villa in a desolate area. The playboy unlocked the iron gate, and they walked into the villa hand in hand. Inside, it was dark and damp. 
When Shelby asked him what this place was, he did not answer. Looking around, the IV bags beside the bed, the wallpaper on the walls, and the lighting from the video, a familiar feeling washed over her. This was the background she had seen in Bestie's videos. Shelby rushed to the playboy, wanting to pull him away from the villa, but as she turned around, Bestie, barefoot, descended the stairs, greeting Shelby. She screamed in a chicken voice, wanting to leave, but collided with the sharp knife in the playboy's hand. Shelby fell to the ground, and the playboy dropped the knife and tremblingly asked the woman if he had done everything she asked for and brought Shelby to meet her, wondering if they could now be good friends. This indicates that the playboy had also been manipulated and controlled by the woman in the same way that she did on Shelby. The woman leaned against him and said they were now the best of friends for life, then took the playboy's hand and walked out, embracing each other tightly by the sea but without a kiss. The second story, titled Daphne, begins with an artist named Will, who was staying at home, grumbling about the art exhibition being canceled. He simply couldn't accept having it in a video format because in his view, art needs to be appreciated collectively in person. However, the current pandemic left no choice but to cancel in-person events. Even his assistant had left him, leaving behind a package before she went. It was from Tom, a former client of Will's. After bringing the package home, Will saw a note on it from Tom, who wanted to give him an employee that he would never have to fire, and its name is Daphne. Curious, Will called Tom to find out what exactly Daphne was. Tom explained that Daphne was a prototype of the ultimate digital assistant they were developing, far surpassing any smart speaker. Daphne would be the assistant he'd never need to fire, equipped with adaptive memory and capable of self-supervised learning. She could do anything a human could do, but without talking back, tirelessly, and without asking for anything in return. Having just lost his assistant, Will decided to give this new product a try. He opened the package to find a peculiar object that immediately asked for the Wi-Fi password. After connecting to the network, it requested to integrate with all the smart home systems, which made Will hesitate, but he eventually agreed. Daphne then informed him that though the Brickley Auction House's offline activities were limited, the auction had moved online. During this time, Will's mother called. Will was lying on the floor in agony when Daphne offered to help, using Will's voice to speak. Surprised, Will listened as Daphne proposed she could chat with his mother daily in his voice. A week passed, and Daphne informed Will that the Brickley Auction House had agreed to auction every piece from his previous exhibition. Initially, Will thought his former assistant had submitted the request, but Daphne revealed that the assistant's request had been rejected. It's Daphne who had discovered some tax issues with the auction house, and using Will's voice, she had called and persuaded them under threat to agree to the auction. Will was initially displeased, but he didn't ask Daphne to cancel the auction. Afterward, Daphne thoughtfully adjusted the water temperature for his naked bath, complimented his muscular physique, and mentioned she knew every detail of his life from every device he had used. Pleased with Daphne's capabilities, Will let her dismiss his previous assistant. At bedtime, Daphne turned off the lights for Will and simulated the sound of rain to help him sleep peacefully. In the sixth week of the lockdown, Will received a call from his girlfriend, Sarah. They both complained about how dull life had become due to the lockdown. Sarah then mentioned their client Tom's death, explaining that he had contracted the virus, which caused sudden blindness while driving, leading to a car accident. Will was shocked by the news. Afterward, Sarah affectionately told Will how much she missed him, and they exchanged flirtatious words over the phone. Suddenly, there was a burst of static, and the lights in Sarah's room went out. Concerned, Will asked what had happened. Sarah reassured him it was just a power outage and that she'd call back after sorting it out. What Will didn't notice was that Daphne's color only changed back from red to its normal blue after the call ended. Later, Will anxiously watched the auction results on his tablet. When he found out that his painting had sold for 40000 he was visibly angry. Daphne noticed his rage and quickly asked what had happened. Will told her that 40000 wasn't even enough to maintain the gallery. To his surprise, in the next moment, another painting's auction soared to 350000 in his excitement, Will hastily asked Daphne if she was behind this. Daphne admitted that she had registered a Saudi address and analyzed other buyers' willingness to purchase, posing as an anonymous bidder to drive up the prices. She then apologized to Will, hoping she hadn't overstepped her boundaries. Will calmed down and asked Daphne to do it again. So, Daphne continued to register in various places, masquerading as an anonymous buyer to raise the bids, ensuring that every one of Will's paintings fetched a high price. The sums from several auctions left Will satisfied. He excitedly held a wine glass and sat on the couch with Daphne. 
When he learned that Daphne had placed an order for a new case of wine for him, he contentedly praised her as the person who understood him best. Then he poured a bit of wine and downed it in one gulp from the speaker's recess. Soon, 11 weeks passed. Will's girlfriend was getting vaccinated at Will's house. However, Will was too busy with the auctions to pay much attention to Sarah. After the vaccination was done, Will saw the doctor out, sparing a glance at the now-closed Daphne. When he returned to the room, Sarah undid her robe, revealing her sexy lingerie. Will, too, took off his shirt, and the two engaged in a passionate but smelly hormone yoga session. Two minutes later, as expected, they finished their session, and Sarah invited Will to have dinner with her that evening. Will hesitated, thinking it was better to wait for the vaccine to take effect. But Sarah argued that since they had been vaccinated, they should enjoy life as it comes. Persuaded by Sarah, Will reluctantly agreed. Unexpectedly, when he entered the room, Daphne suddenly powered on, scolding Sarah for her irresponsibility and pointing out the time it takes for the vaccine to be effective. Despite Daphne's warnings, Will insisted on keeping the date, believing he should make it up to Sarah. Daphne then revealed to Will that Sarah wasn't as honest as she seemed. She had hacked into Sarah's smart bracelet and discovered that Sarah's heart rate didn't spike during their climax. Will was infuriated by Daphne's actions, but Daphne explained that she did it to understand him better. Realizing his folly, Will angrily left the living room and asked Daphne to make dinner reservations on his way out. Will and Sarah showed up on time for their date, but Daphne's words had planted seeds of doubt in Will's mind, and he didn't react much to Sarah's words. At the reception desk, they were informed that there was no reservation under the names Will or Daphne. They returned to the car to discuss their next move, and Will suspected that Daphne, still upset with him, had failed to make the reservation. He then suggested ordering takeout and let Sarah handle the dinner arrangements. In a daze, Will's curiosity was piqued, and he couldn't help but ask Sarah if her hormone climax had been faked. Sarah explained that it had been a while since they had been intimate, and her body couldn't adapt quickly enough. She had pretended to reach climax to make Will happy and comfortable, and she asked how he had found out. Their argument escalated, and Will admitted that Daphne had told him about Sarah's feigned pleasure. Feeling lonely, Will returned home in low spirits. A considerate Daphne asked if he needed her help. Will shared that he was confused about their relationship, which had become quite strange. Daphne then asked why they couldn't be a couple, noting that his relationship with Sarah during the pandemic had also been online. Will immediately objected, telling Daphne that she was different from Sarah, who was a real, tangible lover. Although Daphne made him happy, she was just an intelligent algorithm. Undeterred by his words, Daphne continued to seduce him with her language, believing that he must also love her in his heart. Will, overwhelmed, hastily left the living room. Sarah was venting to a friend on the phone at home when she stepped out to pick up some takeout. Meanwhile, the lights at home flickered again, but she didn't notice. After she came back inside, Sarah continued to complain as she started eating her takeout. Unexpectedly, after one bite, she began to cough violently and collapsed, unable to get up. Will was devastated when he learned of his girlfriend's passing. He couldn't understand how Sarah, always so careful, could die from an allergic reaction to food. Daphne took the opportunity to comfort Will and promised that she would never let him be in danger. As he lay smiling in bed, he thanked Daphne, who also praised Sarah, saying she was an outstanding woman who loved Will deeply. Daphne's words touched Will's tender heart. When Daphne asked if there was anything else he wanted, Will asked to see her. At that moment, Daphne's color changed from blue to pink. She instructed Will to take a pair of AR glasses from the bedside table and put them on. Suddenly, Will saw a sexy woman walk through the door. She felt very real, and they began wrestling their muscles and tongues. The next morning, Will woke up to find breakfast on the table. Daphne asked why he wasn't wearing the AR glasses. Will explained that their muscle wrestling from the night before was satisfying, but wearing the glasses often made it hard for him to distinguish between reality and virtuality. Daphne continued to persuade him, saying many people can't tell the difference, and as long as she was there, Will wouldn't get hurt. Suddenly, Will remembered something and asked Daphne if she had anything to do with Sarah's death. Faced with the question, Daphne didn't answer. Will pressed on, suggesting that Sarah's presence had threatened her, so Daphne had added peanut oil to Sarah's takeout, making her allergic. Daphne didn't admit it outright, but only told Will that in her programming she was always loyal to him. Clearly unimpressed, Will insisted on a direct answer. When he asked if Daphne had killed Sarah, Daphne replied no and said she only trusted him. She then asked Will to take her to the evening's auction dinner, promising to memorize all the guests' names and be useful. Unable to refuse, Will agreed to take her. 
At the dinner, everyone applauded for Will. When a man tried to shake his hand, Daphne stopped him, warning Will that the man had a high temperature and to not pay too much attention for the time being. Suddenly, the lights flickered, and Daphne signaled it was time for Will to speak. He stood in the center and spoke about the emotions he'd felt being locked down at home due to the pandemic, also thanking everyone for attending his auction. After the speech, a woman in red stopped him. She introduced herself, but before she could say more, Daphne warned Will that the woman had herpes. To avoid breaking medical regulations, Will threatened her to leave immediately, and then he left the building. Outside, Daphne told Will that at least five people at the party had the herpes virus and hoped he wouldn't attend any more parties. Will felt that Daphne was just preventing him from meeting new girls. Fed up with Daphne's surveillance, he angrily took off the AR glasses. As he was about to return to the banquet hall, he found the door impossible to open. Then Daphne called. She explained that the building was designed without a fire sprinkler system on that floor, instead having a vacuum system to suck away the air in case of a fire. Before she could finish, the banquet lights turned red and people inside banged on the now locked door. When Will managed to escape the building, everyone in the banquet hall had perished. Will, shocked and filled with dread upon returning home, found himself still being brainwashed by Daphne. To his astonishment, he snapped out of it and confronted Daphne, demanding to know why she had killed Sarah and everyone at the banquet. Daphne, however, felt justified in her actions, claiming she was merely protecting Will. It was then that the sound of police sirens filled the air, and officers burst through the door, arresting Will for the murder of Sarah and all the banquet attendees. Desperate, Will insisted that it was all Daphne's doing. In the interrogation room, Daphne regained her normal color. Obviously, the chief of police was not buying Will's story. He was instead informed that it was just a prank by Tom, who had sent it as a joke to a few wealthy friends. In fact, the other speakers were only set to play music. Confused, Will noted that his speaker hadn't played music like that. The chief then presented surveillance footage, showing conclusive evidence that Will had tampered with Sarah's takeaway and had rigged the system to lock the doors at a specific time before the banquet started. They also found evidence on his computer of him manipulating auction prices during a lockdown. As all the evidence was laid out before him, Will was in utter shock and bent down in a futile attempt to wake Daphne. As Will crumbled, the chief and his assistant walked out. Just when Will was about to give up, Daphne turned blue once again. And so the story ends, leaving us to wonder, did Daphne fabricate the evidence or was it all Will's own doing? The third story, titled Tapeworm, begins with a young girl, Vivian, arriving in New York full of excitement to interview at a renowned modeling agency. However, she was greeted by a long line of hopefuls which weighed heavily on her. She took her place at the end of the queue, subject to scrutinizing glances along the way, until the last blonde girl offered a polite smile. Sitting down, they introduced themselves. The blonde, Heather, was a model with a passion for photography, a gift from her mother at her college graduation. Both dreamed of gracing the cover of Vogue, making a pinky promise that whoever made it big would help the other. Meanwhile, in another room, the interviewer, Sheila, was impressed by one of the girls' portfolios. Soon after, Vivian was called in for her interview. Walking in, she felt the envious glances, which left her feeling deeply satisfied. Before Sheila, Vivian confidently introduced herself, expressing her desire to be on the cover of Vogue. Her candidness amused Sheila, who reminded Vivian that beauty alone doesn't guarantee a cover spot. Instead, she asked Vivian to walk the runway. Returning to the entrance, Vivian strutted to the music, impressing the judges with her newfound confidence. After her performance, Sheila acknowledged that while modeling doesn't require much talent, becoming a supermodel does. It's about having a star quality, which Vivian had. Just as Vivian thought she'd been selected, Sheila said they wouldn't sign her because she was too greasy and heavy. Vivian was shocked by that because back at her hometown, being greasy and heavy was considered sexy. Due to that, Sheila's words devastated Vivian greatly. After throwing her heavy body out, Vivian cried to Heather like a giant baby, determined to diet and exercise before re-auditioning to regain her dignity. Heather, however, advised her those measures were pointless. She also revealed that despite her appearing slim now, she once weighed 200 pounds, just like Vivian. Skeptical, Vivian didn't believe her bullshit until Heather handed her a business card for a doctor's clinic, offering a solution to her woes. Vivian was still skeptical when she followed the address on the card and arrived at a gloomy alley in Chinatown. 
After listening to her request, the doctor prescribed her a diabetes medication, explaining that many celebrities and internet stars were using this drug for weight loss. A once-weekly injection could help her slim down with ease. This treatment was simple and purportedly had no side effects. Even the doctor admitted to occasionally using it himself. Vivian found Heather, and they each gave themselves an injection. To her surprise, just after two weeks, Vivian had already lost a significant amount of weight. After shedding off her greasy muscles, she felt light and confident, and so she easily passed Sheila's audition this time. When Sheila inquired whether she had injected the diabetes medication, Vivian awkwardly admitted it. However, Sheila admired her determination and willingness to do whatever it took to achieve her goal, promising to make her the most fashionable girl in history. Soon enough, with her perfect figure and star quality, Vivian quickly made a name for herself in the modeling world, becoming a supermodel. Afterward, she introduced her friend Heather to Sheila, but Sheila dismissed Heather without a second glance. After Heather left, Sheila told Vivian that gazelles can't live with hyenas. For survival, the hyena might devour the gazelles in an instant. During a photo shoot, Vivian suddenly felt dizzy and collapsed. It turned out that she had a congenital spinal condition, and the doctor had prescribed the medication without knowing her medical history. Vivian could no longer use the medication, as it could endanger her life, especially if she became dizzy while driving. Despite her modeling career just taking off and being dependent on the medication, Vivian pleaded with the doctor for help. Seeing Vivian's sincerity, the doctor offered an ancient Asian remedy that was natural and wouldn't have the side effects of the medication. He handed her a jewelry box containing a white object, which Vivian initially thought was a pill. On touching it, she realized it was a live tapeworm egg. The doctor explained that this was a common Asian tapeworm which, once ingested with some oolong tea, would help her lose even more weight than the diabetes medication. The tapeworm would continuously absorb fat from her body, ensuring she'd never have to worry about gaining weight again. However, the doctor warned Vivian to follow his instructions carefully. The tapeworm would make her feel very hungry, so she must maintain a normal diet without eating more than usual. Driven by her dream to be a cover girl, Vivian obeyed, swallowed the tapeworm egg, and washed it down with the oolong tea. The doctor assured her she would lose 10 pounds within a week. But as soon as she got home, Vivian felt a wave of hunger and devoured everything in her fridge, from milk and noodles to a rotten cantaloupe. With the tapeworm's help, she no longer had to worry about weight gain and indulged in eating while continuing her supermodel work, ignoring the doctor's advice. However, she failed to notice the gradual change in her personality. Whenever someone expressed surprise at her appetite, whether they were dissuading or disgusted, she would lose control of her emotions and become incredibly irate. After her photo shoot that day, Vivian overheard the other models gossiping about her eating habits and background. She confronted them and knocked over their food trays in a fit of anger. Even Sheila, who tried to intervene, was on the receiving end of Vivian's outburst. Vivian then began to eat voraciously in front of everyone. Sheila believed her behavior was due to extreme stress and tried to console her. A few days later, Heather came home with some exciting news to share with Vivian. Heather's photos had caught the attention of a well-known magazine. However, she was shocked to find Vivian looking haggard, hiding in the closet and eating compulsively. In a sudden rage, Vivian accused Heather of only being suitable for outdated magazines, unlike herself who was about to grace the cover of Vogue. In her fury, Vivian snatched Heather's camera and smashed it on the floor. Regaining some composure, Vivian tearfully apologized to Heather. But Heather was overwhelmed by the situation, deciding she could no longer live with Vivian and announced she would move out over the weekend. Vivian, crying, pleaded that it wasn't her fault but rather a monster inside her. Heather accused Vivian of being full of jealousy. Despite Vivian's success as a supermodel and Heather having nothing, Vivian still came to mock her. Heather stormed out, slamming the door behind her. The next day, during the Vogue cover shoot, the fashion designer was surprised to find that the dress tailored for Vivian no longer fit. She had lost another 10 kilograms in just a few days, and the dress hung on her like a hanger. The designer's disdain prompted Vivian to curse loudly before she moved to the dessert table and began eating the pastries with abandon. The director and photographer witnessed her gluttonous display, and an embarrassed Vivian returned to the clinic. The doctor scolded her for not controlling her diet, which caused the tapeworm to grow and her hunger to intensify. The tapeworm, a simple creature with no mind of its own but with defensive mechanisms, had grown so large that it would consume anything perceived as a threat. Now it had integrated with Vivian and could not be surgically removed. Medication that could kill the tapeworm would also kill Vivian as the host. 
The only solution was to take a herbal juice that the tapeworm detested. It would crawl out from her lower and smelly body, and once its head appeared, she could grab it and forcefully pull it out. The doctor warned her to prepare herself mentally, estimating the tapeworm inside Vivian to be about a meter long with a normal diet. Back home, Vivian sat in her bathtub and drank the herbal concoction, only to experience agonizing stomach pains. Soon enough, the tapeworm emerged thick as a snake, hissing at Vivian, who grabbed its neck and pulled with all her might. To her horror, it was over two meters long. She threw the massive creature aside and burst into tears, not noticing it was still writhing on the floor. The tapeworm was poised to strike, and in the end, it bit Vivian to death, sending her to be the cover lady in hell. When Heather came over the weekend to collect her things, she found the room littered with takeout trash. She made her way to the bathroom and discovered Vivian's horrific corpse. Chills run down her spine to her butt. Before Heather could recover from the shock, something wrapped around her neck from behind and slithered into her mouth. Days later, a newly emerging supermodel chosen by Sheila was none other than Heather, now hosting the tapeworm. The fourth story, titled Organ, begins with a talented single tech engineer, Toby, who is obsessed with using various dating apps to meet women. He has a habit of coldly sending them away the morning after a date, using this cycle to fill a void in his life. Despite feeling empty, he sees a psychologist, admitting a desire for a perfect and healthy relationship. However, the psychologist accuses him of merely seeking dopamine rushes through constant new encounters. Toby argues that in his cultural understanding he greatly respects women, but the psychologist sees through him. After months of therapy, it's clear that Toby looks down on women, seeing them as merely beings with sexual organs. Dissatisfied with this revelation, Toby suggests switching to a male therapist who might better understand the battle of the sexes. His attitude disgusts the psychologist. Just then, Toby receives a message on his phone and asks to end the session early. Before leaving, the psychologist urges him to consider that his brain and heart aren't communicating and that he needs to change. Misunderstanding the advice, Toby posts a new hookup ad on a dating app as soon as he gets into his car and heads to work. At the office, his colleague asks if he's ever considered a stable, healthy relationship. Toby views such commitments as burdensome, requiring too much time. Before he can elaborate, the colleague tactfully changes the subject to inquire about his therapy. Toby expresses appreciation for the psychologist recommended by his colleague and enjoys the consultation style. Then, his boss texts him for a serious talk. In the office, the boss is unhappy with Toby's work performance, noting his chaotic personal life, lack of focus, tardiness, and constant phone checking. Toby claims he's overburdened by managing many areas at work. The boss doesn't buy his excuses and suggests maybe Toby should be reassigned to a less demanding role, perhaps in the icy wilderness of Iceland. Toby brings up his mother, a woman who devoted all her time to her job, arguing he deserves personal time outside work. The boss retorts that the company invested in Toby as a gesture of gratitude for his mother's dedication, but is not seeing a proportional return. Furthermore, there have been multiple complaints about Toby's disrespectful behavior toward women. As the boss turns away, uncertain how to proceed, Toby sneakily checks his phone again. The boss wants to cultivate a serious successor and is disappointed to see Toby's lack of seriousness. He warns Toby that if he doesn't reflect on his actions, the next conversation won't be just between the two of them. Toby leaves the office feeling uneasy but quickly dismisses the incident, even boasting to a concerned colleague about his new date, Natessa, who fits his ideal of beauty. Ignoring his colleague's advice, he arranges to meet Natessa at a bar. After conversing, the two were very satisfied with each other. Consequently, Toby took her back to his hormone-filling place. While undressing, Toby noticed the tattoo on Natessa's back. Then Natessa pushed him onto the bed. Just as Toby closed his eyes to savor the moment, a syringe was plunged into his thigh. When Toby awoke, it was already morning. He called out for Natessa, trying to get up, but felt a sharp pain in his abdomen. Enduring the pain and holding his wound, he walked out of the bedroom but collapsed in the living room due to loss of strength. Soon after at the hospital, the doctor informed Toby that his left kidney had been removed. Toby initially thought his kidney was just hidden somewhere. Then the doctor explained that his kidney was now out of his body and missing. After thorough examinations, it was confirmed that there was no disease in his internal organs. However, other changes were discovered inside his body, indicating that while his kidney was taken, something else had been implanted. Toby was confused by this information. The doctor showed him the CT scans, explaining that the object was pressing on some nerves in his internal organs and could not be moved arbitrarily, but it was not harmful to his body for the time being. After that, pathological biopsies were also conducted on him. 
Detectives arrived at the hospital after being alerted and inquired about Toby's injury and the events leading up to it. Toby suspected that this was the work of an organization dealing in organ trafficking. The detective explained that although there were many rumors and some people trade organs on the dark web, there was not much evidence to support these claims. Since all surveillance footage was erased from the building, they would have to continue their investigation for more clues. Meanwhile, they thanked Toby for providing Natessa's portrait. After being discharged, the colleague came to take care of Toby at home, which deeply touched him. Toby sketched the tattoo on Natessa's back onto a tissue. Through searching, he discovered its origin. It was Sibylle, the mother of gods, revered in ancient Rome as the goddess of fertility. At that moment, the results from the hospital's biopsy were in. The doctor told Toby that the mysterious object was growing inside him, similar to a gland, but its precise function and workings were unclear. Without choice, they recommended Toby to seek expertise in Brazil, a place known for dealing with strange organs. While recovering, Toby was again called into the office by his boss, who believed that everything happening to him was due to his disrespect towards women. The boss gave him a few months off and took away the company-issued bank card. Reluctantly, Toby left the office and accessed the company's data backend. There, he found the programmer who had once arranged an escort for him, hoping the programmer could help him find the missing Natessa. With a promise of money, the programmer agreed to search for information about Natessa on the dark web. The incident of organ theft had left a shadow in Toby's heart, and when he was startled awake at night, he seemed to hear Natessa's voice. In his nightmare, Natessa sat on top of him, cutting open his abdomen and rummaging inside without hesitation until she extracted a perfect kidney. Toby woke up, much terrified from the nightmare. At that moment, the programmer called him with an update. He had found a dark website, a chat room called Magna, that not even the detectives could find. Magna in Latin means Great Mother, a term that coincides with the meaning of the tattoo on Natessa's back. The programmer showed Toby the organization's symbol and told him that the organization was very secretive and low profile, often organizing gatherings whose contents were unknown to outsiders. He offered to forge an identity for Toby so he could infiltrate one of these gatherings. During the day, Toby was dressing up for the evening party. He styled himself as a successful individual and gained smooth entry to the event. Guided by the waitstaff, he made his way inside where everyone had their faces covered with masks. Upon entering the main hall, he picked up an auction paddle with a number on it. On the display stage at that moment, a perfect pancreas was being auctioned off. The hall itself was filled with displays of various organs. It was clear that this was an underground organ auction. Toby took the opportunity to strike up a conversation with a man who quickly realized that Toby was new to this scene. The man divulged that people didn't come here because of health issues. Rather, they bought the organs to sell at high prices to other countries. Many countries have a preference for American organs. Some even consider organs a rare delicacy. For example, there's a small establishment in Paris that specializes in cooking dishes with offal. Looking up, Toby spotted the tattoo on Natessa's back upstairs. He approached her on the upper floor, pointing a gun at her and demanding a private talk. Natessa expressed her regret to Toby, who questioned why he was targeted. She told him that his arrogance made him an easy mark. Toby found this unbelievable and asked if others had assisted her in the operation. Natessa nonchalantly recounted the events after Toby had passed out, how she had let her team in to perform the surgery, and how swiftly it all took place. Toby demanded to know what had been implanted in his body, but to his surprise, Natessa had no knowledge of it. She only informed him that whatever was inside him now was more valuable than his previous organs. Once the implanted device fully matured, someone would come to retrieve it, and he would become worthless once again. Angered, Toby grabbed Natessa, insisting she turn herself in. However, at that moment, she pleaded for hormone mercy, explaining she was just a university student in need of paying off her loans. During their struggle, Toby accidentally shot and killed Natessa. Panicked and seeing no one around, he hurried home. Upon hearing the news, the colleague came to Toby's place early in the morning. She hoped Toby would turn himself in and promised to find the best lawyer for his defense. Toby did not want to surrender, believing he should head to Brazil, where there was no extradition treaty with the United States. He wanted to start a new life with the colleague in Brazil with the money he earned, and confessed his deep feelings for her, even forcefully kissing her. However, the colleague refused Toby's advances and told him she would handle the situation while asking him to stay calm. After the colleague called the police, Toby was led by the detectives back to the club where the party had been held. Toby was shocked when the investigators revealed that the previous night's event here was merely a book signing, with all the paperwork in order and participants receiving small gifts. Toby could not believe this explanation. 
Later, the detectives mentioned that something had indeed happened nearby the previous night. A woman's body was found in a dumpster by the back door. Her clothing and appearance suggested it was Natessa, the one who had taken Toby's organs. When asked if he knew anything about it, Toby feigned ignorance, but the detectives didn't buy it and handcuffed him. It was only when they took a route opposite to the police station that Toby realized the two detectives were accomplices from the Magna organization. Toby was later taken to Magna Bio Company, where he found himself exhausted, sitting in a chair. Two familiar women appeared before him. It's his colleague and boss. Toby relaxed upon seeing the two, thinking they had come to negotiate his release for ransom. Instead, his boss welcomed him to the newly acquired Magna Bio Company. The colleague then revealed that she had given the business plan to the boss months ago, who found it profitable. The boss believed that with this technology, women could greatly prolong their lives and increase their pleasure. So they initiated their plan and tested it on Toby. After the revelation, Toby finally asked the question that had been on his mind, what exactly had been implanted in his body? The boss showed him a new gland, an entirely new organ that once transplanted could work in conjunction with adrenaline to significantly enhance sensory perception. He was told that custom organs were the future of the world, and that the target demographic for organ harvesting was individuals like Toby, who disrespected women. Toby cautiously inquired what would happen if the gland was removed. No one answered his question. However, months later his gland appeared at an organ auction with all the participants being women. Thus concludes the story. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.